course, it's a, a tremendous uh, honor to receive uh, this uh, award. I can only say that, that what I did was staying alive and doing the same thing all over again. But uh, thank you very much for this. Um, every now and then, I recommend the field of clinical neurogastroenterology to a junior colleague, a trainee, and then I always say that it's so attractive because developments in clinical neurogastroenterology are slow and it is easy to uh, keep track of it. I, I mean this in a positive way. Some developments are too fast, I believe, and in neurogastroenterology it may be better. Uh, maybe not in basic scientists, the basic science, but it's often difficult to translate the basic science discoveries into clinical realm. We can start our um, description of the developments by starting with <coughs> this person called Galen or Claudius Galenus, who was born in Turkey and then later on in, in life he moved to Rome, so he was a migrant. And um, he developed uh, uh, thoughts about the functioning of the human body and about medicine. And uh, they dominated the medicine in the Western world for about 1,500 years. And that is very good of him because most of his thoughts, as you know, were utterly wrong. <laughs> One of the things that he achieved and contributed to our field is the word peristalsis. It comes from his writing and uh, it is acknowledged until today. This person here is um, a Dutchman. He lived at the time of Rembrandt in, in Amsterdam. And he was, in addition to being a doctor, he also was the mayor of Amsterdam for quite some years. And he wrote a book about medicine that was world famous in, in the lowlands. And in that book he also describes uh, the motility of the GI tract. It's uh, very poetic and brief and actually not saying anything. Uh, it's like a worm, etc. But he also acknowledges the term peristalsis that was coined by Galenus. So in those 1500 years between Galenus and Talp, nothing has changed. <laughs> and then it went on for a couple of more centuries and still not very much going on. Um, I think we made some more progress when the x-rays were discovered and this uh, American pioneer Walter Cannon described the movements of the GI tract uh, very carefully. He was not so careful with the x-rays because he had severe skin damage and died of leukemia, but he was a real uh, pioneer and so was Hans Joachim Erlein. And we see here the movie uh, that I would like to show to the students because it is the events that precede vomiting. This is a dog made sick with epimorphin and then you see this giant movement retrogradely of small intestinal contents into the stomach uh, and there it accumulates before being vomited. It's a beautiful movie. <laughs> Of course, it involved the radiation, but and nowadays with MRI techniques, it's possible to see these movements without danger being involved. And here we see the slow movements of the colon. This is from Robin Spiller's group, available on the internet. And here is also the colon, and there we see the retrograde movement that we know as mass movement. And manometrically, it would be associated with the giant migrating uh, contraction. And you can also use MRI to study the process of defecation, and that has become a clinically useful tool in many of the clinics. And I believe that there is a future for MRI also in the clinic, and m maybe I live long enough to, to see it uh, happen, but that's certainly a promising uh, development. We also thought that electrocastography was very promising. Here we have a 
a person called Alvarez. He lived at the time of a cannon, and he, on the 14th of October 1921, attached electrodes to the abdominal skin of an elderly lady with a large cicatricial hernia, and she, the skin was so thin that he could see the movements of the stomach through the skin. And he recorded from these electrodes that were connected to a string galvanometer, uh, he recorded a sinusoidal wave that you see in the top, and the frequency of this wave was exactly the same as that of the rhythmic contractions that he could see through the skin three per minute, an interval of 20 seconds. And this, uh, when I read this uh, in the late 70s, I found it very fascinating. And uh, during my PhD <coughs> studies, we did experiments in dogs to see what was it that we were measuring with electrochistography. And as you can see here, you, in the left panel, you can also record the sinusoidal slow wave from the skin uh, when there is no contraction at all present in the stomach during motor quiescence, during phase one of the interdigestive migrating motor complex. And during phase two, when there are contractions, the amplitude of the sine wave increases. And in man, it's the same picture. In the fasting state, there is a low amplitude sinusoidal wave, but the frequency there is three per minute rather than five in the dog. And after a meal, the amplitude of the EDG signal increases. But by no means is there a direct proportionality between the amplitude of the EGG waves and the amplitude of the contractions that you could measure in or at the stomach. <coughs> we were thrilled by the idea that there were tachygastrias, episodes of uh, rapid rhythm in the gastric entrum, uh, uh, they were, occurred spontaneously in, in the dogs, especially when they were a bit afraid. And uh, you can see here a, a, a frequency of about 16 per minute in the antrum, in the uh, serosal signal, but also in the um, EGG signal and in its spectrum. And then, of course, the question was, do tachygastrias occur in man, and are they the explanation of all misery that we have in the upper abdomen, for instance, in patients with functional dyspepsia. And yeah, we did see some uh, tachygastrias um, in a proportion of patients with functional dyspepsia, but they were usually very short lived and we didn't have a treatment for them and they didn't correlate well with symptoms. Uh, so it was not a very happy story. I call them here definite tachygastrias because we required for the electrogastrographic diagnosis of tachygastria that there would be an episode of abnormally high frequency, 8 per minute, uh, whereas at the same time the normal frequency at 3 per minute had to be interrupted. Others, mentioning no names, others have used more liberal EGG uh, types of analysis and they would call anything that is a bit irregular and chaotic, uh, either in the raw signal or in the spectrum, they would call that arrhythmia. And this led to an epidemic of gastric dysrhythmia. And if you look at the literature of EGG, you can find uh, arrhythmias with all sorts of diseases. The number of publications on EGG per year in, in English uh, has risen uh, tremendously but then uh, it started to decline. And I'm afraid that I have to agree with uh, my friend, Professor Michael Horowitz from Adelaide, South Australia, that there is nothing funny about electrogastography except that it doesn't work. <laughs> so uh, at these early days of my career, uh, we were, um, interested in contractions and in slow waves. We, we knew what slow waves were, um, but we didn't know that they had anything to do with the interstitial cells of Kachal that came later. But uh, we were fascinated by these contractions and we thought that if we would measure them uh, accurately enough, uh, that we would make diagnoses and that we could eventually help patients 
with diseases. Um, an example of this is uh, this paper uh, that described that patients with the irritable bowel syndrome had, it was published in gastroenterology, uh, they had uh, significantly more three <coughs> cycle per minute myoelectrical and contractile activity in their rectal sigmoids than did control subjects. Uh, this finding later on was never reproduced and it, it turns out not to be a, a good way to diagnose uh, IBS. But we were thinking at the time that this would be the way forward. Wrong we were. Another major uh, development it was the invention of the sleeve sensor by John Dent, which made it possible to record this pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter or other sphincters for a prolonged period of time. And with this device, it was uh, discovered that when you distend the proximal stomach, then there will be a transient LOS relaxations, a relaxation via the vagus nerve and also relaxation of the crural diaphragm. And this is a true reflex which makes it possible that we belch. But in addition to making belching possible, it's also the mechanism through which reflux uh, occurs. And in patients without hiatus hernia, teleosars are responsible for most of the reflux episodes. In patients with hiatus hernia, they are still very important but there are additional mechanisms in, uh, in action. <coughs> this was very interesting for, uh, for a while because we thought that we could use drugs that inhibited TLSRs to uh, treat reflux disease in a more uh, pathophysiology-based way. And the GABA B receptor agonists, including the prototype baclofen and the glutamate receptor antagonists were studied quite extensively. And you all know at the, at the end of this story, uh, they were found not to be effective enough. And they also had side effects. So we had to, to put them to rest. And uh, that was a very sad moment. Uh, but we had more dissolutions. Um, uh, <laughs> I could read their names, but it's just enough. Just one moment of silence will do. <laughs> but there are other drugs uh, that are being developed, and that, uh, there's always hope, uh, and there will be, in, in the end, there will be good organ-specific pro-mortality drugs and TLSR inhibitors, and you name it. Yet another important development is, of course, uh, the pH monitoring of the distal esophagus, pioneered by Tom de Meester at Honolulu. And uh, with this technique, you can not only measure acid exposure, but also <coughs> study the temporal association between symptom, next, uh, symptom episodes and reflux events. And this makes it possible to divide the pH sufferers, I mean the reflux sufferers, into four subgroups, uh, that is those who have excessive acid exposure and a positive symptom association, those who only have a positive symptom association but normal acid exposure, and we call them now reflux hypersensitivity, those who have excessive acid exposure and a negative symptom association, so they do have good, but the symptoms have nothing to do with it. And you have those individuals who have neither, so have physiological acid exposure and negative symptom association, and they are labeled functional heartburn. The th story became even more interesting when impedance monitoring uh, arose. In, in the beginning, it was thought that it would be a good way to study esophageal transit, transit of a bolus, but later on we found that uh, looking at reflux and that gas movements was actually more rewarding. And this shows an example of a TLOSR um, during which there is a reflux measured with the impedance, but it is not acid. And not acid. 
And so the, the concept of non-acid reflux uh, was born. Uh, this is a graph that I made myself. It's not completely scientific, but it, it, I think it's true. Uh, here you can see the, the available level of acid inhibition that we got used to since the uh, early 70s. Stronger and stronger acid inhibition became available. And when we look at the satisfaction of the average reflux patient uh, with the results of the treatment, then it didn't run in parallel. It's on the decline. And I, uh, uh, we, we know that about 50% at least of patients with reflux disease is not satisfied, totally satisfied with the result of Dutch treatment. And I predict that if we would have an even stronger uh, acid inhibitor, <laughs> that the uh, res result would not get better. Of course, uh, one of the things that is plays a role here in, that in general people become more and more demanding and less satisfied. So, but if we subtract that, I think it would be a, a flat line. Better. What are the reasons for incomplete satisfaction of our patients? Well, first of all, they may have ongoing non-acid reflux, as we know now, and the diagnosis of reflux disease may have been wrong to begin with. And that occurs in about a third of patients with insufficient symptom response, about 30% has functional heartburn when you study them properly, and a few percent even has things like agalasia or, or rumination. A mystery that we always put under the carpet, uh, I believe, is that most reflux episodes, acid reflux episodes, occur after a meal, and also symptoms tend to, be, to occur most frequently after the meal. Whereas the meal was supposed to neutralize the acid. And if you measure esophageal pH and gastric pH at the same time, then we could find episodes where the esophageal pH during a reflux episode was lower than the gastric pH. And we didn't understand how it was possible, but we didn't want to think about it, really. But then... Um, Ken McCall and his group uh, from Scotland did a series of very simple experiments uh, that made it all a bit clearer. And uh, they first did a withdrawal of a pH electrode from the stomach into the esophagus in the fasting state. And as expected, you see acid pH in the stomach and then a steep rise when it passes the esophageal gastric junction. But when they repeated the experiments after a standard meal, which in their case, of course, was fish and chips, <laughs> and they repeated the withdrawal experiment, then they saw that after the neutral pH in the stomach, there was an area with a low pH and then the, the neutral pH restored. And this was called the acid pocket, and it is, of course, an area of unbuffered acid, freshly secreted. One should keep in mind that the meal is a potent stimulus for acid secretion via the nervous vagus. It's not completely blocked by PP, PPIs. And uh, so we have this area of acid sitting just distal to the esophageal gastric junction, ready to reflux. And now uh, we uh, better understand that other means of uh, Com combating a reflux, such as with the combination of an alginate and an antacid, may work better than other techniques. This is a study comparing combination of an antacid and an alginate with an antacid only. And as you can see, the position of the acid pocket below the diaphragm and the number of acid reflux in all reflux episodes were improved by this combination preparate, uh, combination better than with antacid only. Now this is a very busy slide for which I apologize, but I didn't make up all these inventions. Uh, th this is what happened in my lifetime. I was born in 1950, and now we are here in 2017, I believe. And we have learned more and more and more and more diagnoses uh, 
were possible and are being made. Some of our patients visit us because they have um, excessive belching. And almost invariably the doctor then thinks this is aerophagia. And that is usually quite wrong. Because there is not excessive air swallowing in most of these patients. This is an impedance recording of an air swallow. And this is an impedance recording of a classical belch where the air comes from the stomach and very rapidly goes up all the way to the mouth. And this is a type of belch uh, that looks differently. Air goes in like this and out like that. I will expand this image a bit so that you can see it better. Same image. Air goes in, air goes out within one second before having reached the stomach. And that's why we call it supragastric, supragastric belch. Uh, I will show you a demonstration. I hope that you notice that the supragastric belches uh, were much more demanding. It cost me a lot of <coughs> effort. I had to suck the air in the esophagus, whereas the, the, the gastric belches were very easy because they were facilitated by a TLOSR induced by the Coca-Cola light. <laughs> and I, on Braden order, uh, discovered uh, that in patients with excessive belching, there is a, the same number of air swallows, the same number of gastric belches, but an incredibly much higher number of supragastric belches. And that is, uh, of course, be, offers some hope for these patients because you can unlearn the supragastric belching, um, for instance, uh, under the direction of a, a trained speech therapist. Yet another development that altered the clinical um, neurogastroenterology, and that is, of course, high-resolution manometry, pioneered by Ray Klaus, and he was fond of making these uh, Rocky Mountains uh, perspectives, but uh, nowadays it's usually represented in colors. He showed that in most cases there is a concordance between diagnosis made with conventional manometry, which is called here limited methods, and uh, topographical methods. But in some cases there were differences, and of course, high resolution was better. At those early stages, uh, the more senior clinicians who had worked all their life making diagnosis of esophageal motor disorders with conventional manometry were a bit uh, dubious about this new invention, about this topography and high resolution manometry. But uh, I was one of them, one of the critical. Uh, but, um, but of course, as you all know, um, high resolution manometry has conquered the world and is here to stay. And it's not only because it gives a sort of artwork uh, that you can display in your office, but it's also because it makes recording of uh, manometry, esophageal manometry, easier and more standardized all over the world, and that is really a big advantage. However, um, the classifications of esophageal motility disorders went berserk uh, when uh, this happened. We had had this 2001 classification by Speckler and Castell based on conventional manometry. And then suddenly there were three iterations of the Chicago classification based on high resolution manometry. And that is a bit too much for the average clinician. Uh, and if you would think that these were minor changes that you could easily take on board, uh, then you are mistaken because, for instance, the difference between conventional and Chicago 2, I don't mention Chicago 1 because that was a mess, but Chicago 2 
was a bit more logical. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of new uh, diagnoses and new terms, but the same uh, classification a few years later, it was uh, reduced to this. So I think it would have been better if we um, would have thought about this a bit longer and then made a classification that would um, be uh, viable for a few decades. Another application of high resolution manometry, uh, which is very interesting, is of course colonic um, manometry. Uh, this is work from Australian group, where you can see that, that if you study colonic motility with manometry with 10 centimeter spaced um, recording sites, that you have no idea in which way the waves will be propagating if any, anywhere. If you use five centimeters, you may have the impression here that it is anti-grade movement, whereas if you have the, um, the image of one centimeter space tracings, you can clearly see that there are many retrograde waves. Whether or not this is of clinical importance, uh, I cannot tell you. Um, we have to reconsider in a few decades from now. Also in anorectal manometry, high resolution manometry is useful because it makes it possible to differentiate axial displacement, movement of the catheter with respect to the anal sphincters from true relaxations and contractions. <coughs> now one um, warning finger I would like to raise, and that is that we have seen many new non-pharmacological non treatment options that were not studied properly but put on the market to treat patients with uh, motility disorders such as reflux. And I would say that these non-pharmacological treatment options require controlled clinical trials like we are used to do with drugs. An example of this is a study with the endosynch method where after three months endosynch had significantly, though not impressively, reduced acid exposure. But in the group who received sham um, endosynch, there was a similar decrease and the difference between the two treatment effects was not statistically significant. So even with a hard endpoint like acid exposure, you cannot trust the results of an uncontrolled trial. And the same can be said about this radiofrequency ablation technique where in Leuven they studied this with a crossover sham and uh, radiofrequency ablation period, they found that the effect on reflux was not superior to that of sham treatment. And another and last example is sacral nerve stimulation. It's a miraculous technique because you can not only diminish incontinence, but also diminish constipation, which seems to be the opposite. But in this uh, study uh, from Australia, where they used a sham-controlled multiple crossover design, it was found that the sacral nerve stimulation did not increase the frequency of complete bowel movements. At least active stimulation was not more effective than sham stimulation. So um, I've showed you the beginning of this slide before. Uh, showing that we started by being fascinated by contractions and slow waves. Then later on, we realized that we had to take on board that hyperperception of visceral stimuli played an important role in many of our patients with functional diseases. And that also the brain gut interaction was extremely important. And nowadays, uh, it is, of course, of the utmost importance to look at the interaction with the microbiome. And this is a very complex business. I don't envy uh, those who are into this business at all, because there are so many of those uh, microbes, uh, not only in number, but also in species. So I predict that we, we need a few decades to sort this out. And uh, 
then you would like to know uh, what what else what, what next and then uh, I must uh, admit that I don't know <laughs> I, I never saw any of these things coming in uh, previously so why would I now be able to predict <laughs> Um, so we, we, we need to be humble, and um, the last slide uh, shows <coughs> aphorism that I, I found very applicable to my work. In the grand tradition of science, we refuse to be discouraged by the basic irrelevance of our findings. 